Welcome to the Canine Decoded Show, where we discuss what it means to be a dog at all life stages and circumstances. We will look at the human dog bond and highlight current findings of canine science. I'm excited to have expert guests from around the world on the show to bring together our understanding of the species dog. And of course, I will give you practical tools for your everyday life with your beloved companion. I'm Dr. Melanie Ude, founder of Canine Decoded and your host on the Canine Decoded Show. So let's talk about factor number six, which is aggression or aggressive display. So that kind of behavior, and I say aggressive display because it is meant to look aggressive, necessarily mean aggression underlying, but this is what we associate with leash reactivity a lot too, right? So it's growling, barking, lunging at other dogs, blowing up basically, or even other humans. Now the underlying root cause can be excitement and, you know, the dog, because of the frustration of not getting what the dog wants, climbs up the stress mountain and eventually blows up. But it also can be anxiety and fear. So remember walking through the dangerous neighborhood, this kind of stress piles up as well. So you also climb up the stress mountain and eventually you blow up when you're at the peak of it. So the aggressive display is associated with the root cause. And a central part of aggression or aggressive display or whatever triggers that kind of behavior lies in the amygdala. The amygdala is a part of the brain that is very rudimental and triggers the fight or flight response to triggers. There have been a lot of experiments and studies that link the, the aggression or the aggressive display or aggressive behavior to amygdala. So in animals, if you lesion the amygdala, so you inactivate basically that part of the brain, the rates of aggression decline significantly. So no amygdala, basically no aggression. So in humans, it's a very similar concept because the amygdala also triggers aggression here. If you show to humans pictures that make them angry, the amygdala is activated. And you can, you can track that with new imaging. And the amygdala is a very interesting area because it is so so impactful on our behavior. Now, the behavior of aggression, aggression triggers, is located in the amygdala, but also feeling anxious and fearful is located in the amygdala. So now you can see how closely linked being fearful is to being aggressive. And this is something I always um, tell my students when they tell me that my dog, that their dog is just fearful but hasn't shown any aggression. The difference between a fearful dog that hasn't shown any aggression and a dog that has often is just time because the dog climbs the stress mountain. And the outlet of it, because fear and anxiety are so closely related or linked to or located to aggression in the brain, that it is a very small jump to then show aggressive display. And very interesting, I think, in uh, for you to, to understand the, the full picture of it, in PTSD sufferers, you can also see that because of the trauma, the amygdala is activated way faster to mild stimuli, and it takes a lot longer to calm down. So, for dogs that suffer from trauma, they tend to be so irritable and sensitive to even mild stimuli that normal dogs would not react to, and it takes them longer to come down to the baseline calmness or contentment. And that is because of the activity, increased activity of the amygdala, where fear, anxiety, and aggression sit. And here's something that is very, very important. Remember the stress mountain. Now this happens throughout the day, Let's say it's a, it's, a, it's a small stress mountain, but then there's a big stress mountain. And you climb up that stress mountain over years. What that means is that uh, short-term stress can become chronic stress. And if you suffer or your dog suffers from chronic stress, stress in any shape or form, whether it's hyperexcitement, fear, anxiety, you climb up that big chronic stress mountain and that has an impact on the amygdala as well. The amygdala actually expands in size. So the brain part that is responsible for fight or flight becomes bigger. Now having a bigger brain part that triggers aggression 
you can imagine that the aggressive display becomes more frequent, frequent and more intense. That is a natural progression of chronic stress triggered by anxiety, fear, hyper excitement. And maybe just a side note, it has also been shown that the amygdala is particularly sensitive to stressful events in social circumstances. Now dogs are very social creatures and anything that is related to the hierarchy per se, um, the relationship with the owners, the relationship with other humans, with other dogs, the amygdala makes the dog very sensitive to it. Now, if you have a dog that is chronically under stress, and again, we have 4.7 million dog bites in the US every year. And most of the time it involves the dog in the household and someone who lives in the household. And usually this is a social conflict that arises or years of miscommunication potentially, misunderstanding, um, lack of you know some sort of structure but also just the gap of understanding how the dog progresses and climbs the chronic stress mountain and because the amygdala expanding in size making the dog more irritable especially in the context of social conflict now makes the dog more likely to blow up and potentially bite nip someone in the same household and it is understandable if owners say, I've never seen that coming, I didn't think my dog would bite. It makes sense not to see this coming because it is a chronic, slow motion almost process. And no one really talks about how the development or the progress of anxiety and fear can lead to aggression, but it is definitely helpful to understand. So if you see any signs of anxiety, fear, hyper excitement in your dog, and you feel like, well, it's manageable, I want you to really pay attention to this and be cautious to not let this happen where the dog doesn't have a choice because the dog reached the top of the mountain, the top of the chronic stress mountain. So, and to just add one more thing to the amygdala as the center for fight and flight, as the amygdala increases in size, as the amygdala is activated, it also makes long-term memory creation very, very difficult. So at this point, usually once the aggression, the, the anxiety, the hyper excitement has reached a point where it's not manageable anymore, that's when owners start to say, hey, I need a rehabilitation program or I need to start training. But it will take a lot longer because of the hyperactivity of the amygdala that prevents memory from building. And obviously learning new behaviors, breaking habits, making new habits, does require neuroplasticity. I mentioned this when we talked about communication. It requires for the brain to create new neurons, new memories and store it in long term. The amygdala prevents that from happening or minimizes the effect of it. So what that means is learning, rehabilitation will take a lot longer and it's a lot harder than starting early on. Are you curious how to translate the learnings of this podcast into action? Join my Facebook group for more tips, tricks, and protocols. You can find a link to the group on my website on canindecoded.com. All right, so that is the amygdala that uh, triggers fight or flight and is very, very influenced by stress. Let's talk about the factor number seven, which is external and internal reinforcement. So like I said, obviously there's a reason for a dog to behave a certain way and there's always a trigger, which might be other dogs, and a reinforcer. So why is the dog more likely to do it the next time? And there are external and internal reinforcers. So the external reinforcer is a dog. A dog potentially came too close, too often. Some dogs, they just have one event that really disturbed them. We call them single event learners. They're very sensitive. They maybe got into a dog fight and that has changed their view of the world forever. Now they don't trust any dog anymore and they become leash reactive. For others, it's a continuous exposure of too many dogs that invade the personal space. They don't feel comfortable. They are a little anxious. They're just, they're just uncomfortable. And then over time, they develop leash reactivity. But it is always an external trigger, which just as an example for leash reactivity, 
is another dog. Now for another dog to not come any closer if the idea for your dog is, hey, I'm not comfortable with the dog being so close, is to show aggressive display, lunging, barking. And usually in one way or another that works, right? So either you get startled and you turn a different way or the other owner with another dog gets startled and they go a different way, but the result is the same. The distance between your dog and the other dog is increased. And this is exactly what your dog wanted by showing this kind of behavior. Now, anxiety and fear is very powerful and they make dogs very creative. Now, I mentioned with the amygdala that over time the amygdala increases in size that makes the behavior more intense and more creative. But the reason for this is mother nature wants the dog, your dog, to stay safe, right? To fight for survival. And one way of doing so is try to never get in this kind of uncomfortable situation again that potentially threats, is threatening your survival. Now, the next time you see or your dog sees another dog, it's like, okay, that worked the last time. Let me try this again. And it worked again. And then your dog will think in one way or another, not consciously think. Then your dog will, will think, okay, let me bark a little louder or a little more intense and lunge as well. And maybe don't do this when the dog is already 10 feet close. Maybe do it as soon as you see a dog at the horizon. And then maybe do it with every dog or don't just do it with dogs that bark at you. Also do it with dogs that don't pay attention to you. So this progression is become, making this dog from reactive to proactive with the, with the intention of staying safe, keeping the distance because the distance has worked and it keeps you out of dangerous situations. These, these are external reinforcers. Now there's also internal reinforcement. An internal reinforcement is something that we have very little if no um, control over. Here's an example. Internal reinforcements enforcers tap into the natural instincts of a dog. So if a dog continues to chase squirrels, it's because the dog enjoys chasing squirrels. That's an internal reinforcement. There is very little you can do about this. For some dogs, and this depends on the breed and the personality, when they blow up at the end of the leash, they bark. For one, barking can be an involuntary behavior, but barking can also be very self-soothing. So now the dog is like, Ooh, I was barking, I was upset, that felt really good. Now your dog is more likely to do it again the next time. Have you ever heard of people who like jumping out of a plane because of the adrenaline kick or they really like scary movies? That is also because of the adrenaline and some people, some humans, they enjoy this kind of rush and so do dogs. That's why German Shepherds, Belgian Malinois, they are police dogs. They enjoy sometimes, if you teach it the right way, I'm not going to go into detail here, they enjoy having this aggressive display because of the adrenaline rush and it's something about it that gives them a kick. And if that happens, then you, the, the, the whole niche reactivity problem becomes a little bit more complex because the triggers are there and the original fear or hyper excitement and frustration and stress were there, but now the habit is also being reinforced because there is some internal reinforcement. Me and Dr. Julia Espinosa from Harvard, we talked about this in our Harvard panel where we um, illuminated aggression in dogs and talked way more in detail about the nature or the nurture of aggression. So if you're interested in this and you haven't been able to join, let me know, leave a comment. I'm happy to um, potentially give you a summary of what we've discussed there. If you want to learn more about the science of motivation and how you can leverage this to create a well-behaved dog, I invite you to join my free masterclass. You can check my website on canindecoded.com for dates and enrollment information. Okay, now that we have talked about internal and external reinforcement, that brings me to factor number eight, which is habit creation. Now, habit creation 
when generally having a habit of behaving a certain way is usually the result of multiple iterations over this kind of behavior that we would like to stop. And here I want every dog owner and trainer to be just very empathetic because even though for some behaviors, if the original root cause is being addressed and maybe the external triggers are being removed, habits make the dog still behave a certain way even though we don't understand anymore why. And breaking habits and making new habits is an entirely different um, topic and an entirely different process itself. So in general, with any kind of behavior, there's usually two parts to it. One is the addressing the root cause of it. Is it frustration, stress, anxiety, fear? And then also addressing habit creation, breaking and making new habits. So for example, if you become someone who I don't know, it's biting nails, usually that comes when, when you feel nervous or overwhelmed or stressed in any way. Now you can work on the stress levels, you can work on being less anxious, maybe more confident. Oftentimes though, you still find yourself um, biting on nails because of the habit creation and the habit that you have developed maybe over years. So we need to take into consideration that there's a difference between addressing the root cause and actually addressing the habit of a certain behavior. Factor number nine, stationary behavior. Now this is a very, very interesting component of leisure activity. There have been many, many studies that show how movement itself supports other functions like cognitive functions, learning, emotions even. And part of movement, mobility, for us too, humans or dogs moving, involves adrenaline, especially if the fight or flight is being activated. But adrenaline is released and activates motor neurons that make you move, that activate the muscles and all that. Now, adrenaline can be, um, can be synthesized from dopamine or directly released also from the stress response, fight or flight response. And the amygdala that sends signals to the motor neurons, you remember the amygdala is the part where the fight or flight sits, that turns on the fire in your body that makes you want to move, especially for dogs, right? They, they tend to move more so than humans anyways. But once the fi fight or flight response is kicked in, the adrenaline is increased and they want to move. They want to put that energy through adrenaline into something which is, you know, either fight or flight. Now we have to meet our dogs where they at. And again, if you remember um, back when I, when I talked about thresholds, just because the dog is not reacting yet, doesn't mean that the emotional state is aligned with what we think it should be. So that there is a potential that the dog is already um, kind of tense and vigilant, which also means heightened adrenaline. And we need to meet our dogs where they at in this moment, which is the urge of moving. Now, anything that is not giving an outlet for this kind of itch, we need to scratch that itch in our rehab program. Anything that is not giving an outlet for it, normally the stationary behavior that we want our dogs to do when faced with a fight or flight situation, sit one to three, focus, all these things place become extremely difficult for our dogs. Now we are creating more conflict for our dogs, not only do they feel like they're in a position where they have to um, move into this lunging, barking, behaving, um, behaving in a certain way that, that is a stress response, but now we potentially also add stress because we have these expectations for our dogs to be calm, to sit still, to only focus on us which adds another layer of conflict, not only in, in relation to the trigger, but also in relation to you as the owner, because again, it's, it's kind of like what I said, that we are not on the same page sometimes when you go on walks. Now we're not on the same page when it comes to how can we meet our dog's needs. Now here, adding another layer of stress, adding another layer of conflict, I mentioned this earlier, Adding more stress, unfortunately, also um, increases the risk of habitual behavior to occur. Now, we just talked about habit creation and how easy it is to fall into the habit, even though we already worked on the root cause. 
now adding more stress to the situation by asking our dogs to do something that they're not prepared for, that they're not equipped for, adds the risk of falling into old habits, which is lunging, barking, growling, freaking out, blowing up on the leash. And that's exactly what you don't want to do when you go into a rehab program. Now, don't get me wrong, I do think that certain behaviors like focus, right, or heal, or potentially sit if you're at intersection, they're wonderful behaviors, and our dogs do need to learn those. All goes hand in hand with impulse control. But this is usually towards the end of a well-planned rehabilitation program. We do not start with that. We have to bridge that gap between I want to freak out and I can be calm. And in order to do this, you have to meet your dog where your dog is at, what's going on in the brain, what is the metabolism, you know, what is the state of mind. Once you can bridge that gap, then you can lay in all these behaviors that you really want your dog to do. And as a side note, very rarely do we want our dogs to sit as a final behavior when other dogs come by. So peeling to the side, putting the dog in the sit, making the dog look at you, that is not what you really want at the end. What you want is a dog that just continues to work, maybe looks at you, maybe is engaged with you, but ignores the other dog. So the stationary behaviors technically aren't necessarily the end goal anyways. So why do them? If you want to read more about the main learning points of this podcast, you can always find a summary in the blog section of my website at caninedecoded.com. Okay, let's go to factor number 10. This is management versus rehabilitation. Now I talk about the frustration loop that comes with um, the management bucket a lot in my masterclass. So if you haven't heard that yet, or if you're interested, you can go to my website, caninedecoded.com and sign up for the masterclass. So I won't go too much into detail here. I just want to emphasize that there is a management bucket and there is a true rehabilitation bucket. What's the difference? In the management bucket, we as the dog handlers get better. We get better at avoiding triggers. We become more vigilant. We get better at distracting our dogs. The rehab bucket feels differently. It feels like your dog is getting better the longer the dog looks at the trigger. It, it's shorter time for the dog to calm down. It's a delayed response and you feel like you're getting more and more to, to normalcy in your life. So for here, I just want you to, to think about where you at. Do you manage? Do you feel like you made improvements because you improved as the handler? You just got better at managing the situation or has your situation improved because your dog truly rehabbed the root cause you were able to make new habits and break old habits and now we are finally at factor number 11 which are non-verbal cues or signals to your dog and that is mostly related to you as a handler as you go on walks so often what i hear is Students tell that um, professionals they worked with before, they say it's your fault, you are anxious, your dog picks up on it, and because of that, your dog reacts. Now, this is certainly a factor. So your dog can certainly sense your anxiety, and inadvertently, this confirms the dog's suspicion of, for example, another dog, and the dog is more likely to react. But this is just one factor out of 11. And I put this factor at the very end to make sure you understand it, there's not much you can do. You cannot fake being confident. You cannot fake being calm unless you truly feel calm and confident and that you have it under control. And you feeling anxious, you feeling frustrated is a reason for it. It is a real struggle to deal with a reactive, fearful, or anxious dog. So the rehabilitation in a way is a journey that you take together as a dog owner team. So if you are dreading walks, because you're afraid that your dog blows up. In a way, your dog is dreading walks too in anticipation of potential threats or triggers. If you are anxious because a dog could be too close that causes your dog to react, in a way, your dog feels anxious because of that too. So my program, for example, is called Better Together for exactly that reason. It's about you as the owner, together with your dog, going through this journey together and almost rehabbing together to turn anxiety, fear, stress, hyper-excitement 
into more calmness and contentment on walks. All right, so these were the 11 factors that go into leash reactivity. I hope you enjoyed. Um, maybe you took notes, take it all in. If you have any comments, please leave them below. You can also send me an email to melanie at canindecoder.com if you have any other questions about any of these components or want me to go more into detail for one of these components, please let me know. I'm happy to, to respond with another episode or send you an email back. I hope you can enjoy the rest of your week and until the next time.